Good evening, councillors, executive, and members of the public gallery. Welcome to this ordinary council meeting of the Shire of Serpentine, Jarrodale, which is being held on the 19th of September 2022. I declare this meeting open at 7.01pm. I'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional land of the Noongar people and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to advise members of the gallery that this meeting is being audio recorded in accordance with council policy. If you are asking a public question or making a statement or deputation to the meeting, this will be audio recorded. Members of the public are reminded that no other visual or audio recording of this meeting by any other means is allowed. The first item tonight is attendances and apologies, of which we have nil. Item two is public question time. 2.1 is response to previous public questions taken on notice. There is a number of questions there that are in the agenda and will be published in the minutes of this meeting. Item 2.2 .2 is public questions. Can I please ask Silly Cronin from Hopeland to come forward and ask your questions of the meeting this evening? Good evening, councillors, um, executive, and uh, question one. Before June 2014, Darren Road had a roast to refund the sign on it for many years. After it was taken away without any road work being done, I wrote to the council and they replied, claimed to know nothing about it. The road is dangerous for most time. My brother Rob Cronin, age 77, held his bike just before the contact, well, before he contacted the Shirelles on June this year. He told them the accident was caused by upset by hooves spinning their wheels in the mud. This was the second time it had happened, and we can no longer ride in safety on our road. My brother was told it would be paid as part of last year's budget or, if not, early in this year's funding. Darrell Road is still not listed for payment. Can I please request the definitive budget into which the payment of Darrell Road is intended? I will ask the Director of Infrastructure Services to respond to your first question this evening. Uh, through you, Madam President, uh, thank you for the question, um, Mrs. Cronin. Uh, the intersection of Jarrah Road and Carnap Road was upgraded as part of Carnap Road upgrade um, <clears throat> between Keighley Lane to O'Neill Road in the 2013-14 financial year. And that project was funded from Roads to the Recovery Grant. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I'll repeat the response. Mm -hmm. The intersection of Jarrah Road and Carnap Road was upgraded as part of Carnap Road upgrade between Keeley Lane to O'Neill Road in the 2013-14 financial year. And that project was funded from Roads to Recovery Grant. The works were completed in June 2014. Currently, there is no budget or plan to upgrade Jarrah Road 
from its existing gravel surface to a sealed surface. The Shire will, the Shire will maintain the road asset in its current standard. Please lodge a customer service request if you notice any issues with the condition of the road surface. Thank you. I understand you. May I ask your second question? Yeah. Question two. Serpentine Jaradale Shire, past Byford, is isolated from the electric highway of both the RAC and Synergy. That leaves local residents wishing to purchase electric vehicles and the expected increase in tourists without a fast charger in the shop. Has the Shah applied for funding to provide fast charges? If not, can it please be considered? I will ask the Director of Infrastructure Services to respond to your second question this evening, please. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the Shire has recently submitted an expression of interest for funding of electric vehicle charging infrastructure uh, through Volga's um, Arena Feature Fuels program. The application includes the installation of a fast charger for public use in the vicinity of the Byford Library, where the cost would be shared with, on a 50-50 basis between the state government and the Shire. If successful, the funding would be available in 2023-24 20, uh, financial year. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Can I please ask Mr. Bill Denham from Caracup to please come forward and ask your questions this evening? Councillors and officers, question one. Reed Keenan Street Sporting Complex. How much did the BMX track and club rooms cost to design, i.e., the total cost to develop a contribution and the shy input, please? I'll ask the Director of Infrastructure Services to respond to your first question this evening, please. Through you, Madam President. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Denham. The design phase of the project is funded from municipal funds at 33%. And developer contribution, 67%. The design and therefore associated costings are not yet finalized. As at Friday, 16th of September 2022, an amount of $283,026 has been spent on the BMX design. Regarding money, John Oval. It's good to see that finally work has started on the new shelters that are currently being positioned further south. Is the turf now going to be levelled, going straight from the pavilion to the oval rather than through a dip with a drainage pipe underneath, as has been planned for three years? I'll advise that this question will be taken on notice in accordance with Council Policy 1.1.3 public question and public statement time. Ordinary Council meeting, a written response will be provided to you. No problem. Question three, uh, again back on Keenan Street. In October 2020, the State Labor Government gave the Shire $20 million for Stage 1A. In my opinion, now that we are two years on, it's time to give the ratepayers a progress update on works and money spent. I'll ask the Director of uh, Infrastructure Services to respond to your third question this evening, please. Thank you for the question. Um, Council adopted the plan and scope for Stage 1A at the May Ordinary Council meeting this year. We are currently in the detailed design phase, which is incorporating extensive consultation with the stakeholder reference group. The community has been engaged in the project through the establishment of the stakeholder reference group, with several meetings already held. A Keenan Park update will be was provided on the uh, USA SJ project page on the 2nd of August 2022. An update was also provided in the August 22, 2022 edition of the USA SJ e newsletter. A full report will go to Council, including monies spent to date prior to the project going out to construction tender. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Denham. Could I please ask Mrs. Lee Bond to come forward and ask your questions, please? Did the Serpentine Jared Shire purchase an instant response vehicle? If yes, what was the cost? What date was it purchased? If no, is it leased? And what is the cost per year? And what date was it leased? What is the reason for this purchase? How many times has it been used for a vehicle response? What type of vehicle response or responses was it used for and where? I'll ask the Director of Development Services to respond to your first question this evening, Mrs Bond. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and thank you uh, very much for the question. So in response, if you're referring to the incident control vehicle, um, then no, the Shire has not purchased uh, that vehicle. That vehicle is supplied by uh, the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, and it is not leased. The Shire maintains that vehicle and DFES pays for the maintenance costs of that vehicle. As part of the 2021-22 fire season, it was deployed six times to deal with incident control for large multi-day fire events. But if you are referring to another vehicle, um, if you could please provide, or if you could please advise, um, and that will allow us to provide. It does have certain time, Jared Allen, on the side of it. Mrs Bond, can you please just clarify you are referring to the incident control bus? No, it's not a bus, it's a truck. I know the difference between a bus and a truck. Not that stupid. <coughs> may I ask, you may ask a second question. Why does the Shire of Serpentine Jaredale not use the free mulch from the Watkins Road transfer station for council garden needs? but prefer to use ratepayers' money and purchase from a business. I'll ask the Director of Infrastructure Services to respond to your second question this evening, please. Through you, Madam President, and uh, thank you for the question, Mrs Bond. It's common and appropriate practice for a local government to use mulch from suppliers that's certified, consistent and easily available. The Shire uses a variety of mulch with particular characteristics, characteristics appropriate for use in certain locations. Um, for example, uh, coarse mulch is used in streetscapes as it has water was characteristics, uh, can deter weed growth, and is not easily transported by rainwater or, or wind. The mulch available from the waste transfer station is not suitable for majority of the Shire's landscaping needs. However, we are investigating where this mulch can be better utilised in our projects. Do any councillors, their families or friends, or ex-councillors, their families or friends, have arrangements or contracts with the Serpentine Jarrah Shire to provide paid business work for the Shire? And if so, how long has this been in effect? We'll ask the Director of Corporate Services to respond to your third question this evening, please. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Mrs Bond. Um, not all the information you request is held by the Shire or able to be answered by the officers. Procurement within the Shire is a competitive process and is conducted by officers and, as employees of the local governments in accordance with legislation and the Shire's Code of Conduct. For current councillors, legislation and the respective codes of conduct provide for actual and perceived conflicts of interest to be managed appropriately, in line with public service standards. The onus for managing these conflicts of interest rests with the individual councillors. If you have any specific information or concerns regarding conflicts of interest relating to procurement, I encourage you to arrange a meeting with the CEO or to refer the matter to integrity agencies. Thank you, for, thank you for your questions, Mrs Bond. Can I please ask Trevor and Susan Simmons from Cardup to come forward and ask your questions this evening? Councillor, I'm here. 
relating to the economic um, how will the amount of usable horse land sustain five horses and keep that land in the healthy state? I'll ask the Director of Development Services to respond to your first question this evening, please. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you very much for the question. Um, local governments utilise uh, the Department of Agriculture's stocking rate guidelines for rural, rural small holdings in order to assess stocking rates versus land capability. Specifically, the stocking rate calculation takes into account variables such as the number of stock, the soil type of the paddocks, the size of the paddocks, where the paddocks are irrigated, and how long stock is proposed to be stabled for. And it goes further in so far that, based upon the different soil types within the Shire, a different calculation is made using the stocking rate guidelines. In respect of item 10.1.1, based upon the soil type, which is forest field F2A, the area of paddocks, one to six, which is 0.76 hectares. Um, the proposal to irrigate all six paddocks. The proposal to stable horses uh, for 16 hours per day, as well as the proposal to graze horses for the remaining eight hours of the day. The stocking rate calculation permits no more than five horses. A condition has also been imposed to require the update to the equine management plan and once approved for this plan to be adhered to, if council indeed approved the item this evening. Land degradation would represent a non-compliance with an equine management plan and would be able to be addressed under the auspices of the condition. How will the dust from the arena be managed? Has it stopped being managed well in the past? Yeah, and the health risk have been I'll ask the Director of Development Services to respond to your second question this evening, please. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for the question. A condition requiring the update to the equine management plan includes additional detailing of an irrigation regime for the horse arena. And to quote from the report, this seeks to ensure the updated equine management plan details the management of the arena to require it to be irrigated by sprinklers prior to raking and irrigation prior to use for riding during summer months when dust uh, is more prevalent due to drier conditions. Three, stormwater management. How will the stormwater run on our property? Managed, their plan of what they say they have is not working and doesn't seem to be true. I'll ask the Director of Development Services to respond to your third question this evening, please. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for the question. Um, a proposed condition um, is imposed requiring a drainage management plan to be submitted and approved by the Shire. This needs to demonstrate that stormwater from the horse arena is managed to prevent sand and sediment runoff impacting adjacent properties. So once submitted and approved, stormwater will be required to be managed in accordance with the drainage management plan at all times. And again, just with the caveat that um, the council will be considering the matter this evening. Thank you. Item three on tonight's agenda is public statement time. Can I please ask Mary Harris to come forward and present your statement this evening? Thank you for the opportunity. Currently, the SJ Shire has a local planning strategy approved in March 22 by the West Australian Planning Commission that would could not be clearer in the articulation of the desire to preserve the rural areas in the southern section of the Shire. The area also includes the state designated food bowl area of the Peel region, and the proposed site lies in the middle of two important ecological corridors that link the scarp to the coast. 
This pr proposal not only has total disregard for the effects of its planned activities on properties that are adjacent and already perform important rural and food producing functions, but also an insulting ignorance of the environmental consequences of the construction process and then the planned ongoing activities. The SJ Shire clearly recognises the economic significance of the equine industry, which is estimated to produce around 168 million in expenditure retained in the SJ Shire. This is a rural activity and already imply, employs 90 full-time effective people. The overblown economic benefits of the motorsport complex must be called into question, especially when it risks disruption of a significant area of the equine industry. In terms of the environment, let me read to you a very brief synopsis of the potential effects of the proposal as provided by the Peel Harvey Catchment Council. And I quote, the proposed activities, one, are located within the upstream catchment of the Peel Yalgarup wetland system. The system was des designated as wetlands of international importance under the Ramsar Convention on wetlands in 1990 as Global Ramsar Site 482. The actions proposed would need to ensure that they will not have to ha have an adverse impact on both the hydrology and water quality of the Ramsar upstream. Two, are directly adjacent to the Dirk Brook project, which was focused on nutrient management and reducing harmful impacts on the drainage system. Three, are near a number of high ecological value properties within a short distance of the proposed development area, lowlands bushland, six kilometres to the north, King Air conservation property, three kilometres to the south, and Kerala, two kilometres to the west, along with further conservation covenanted properties at the corner of Yangeti Road and Jarrah Road, another adjacent to King Air, and one actually owned by the DLPH. Four, are close to Aboriginal site 3582, are close to resource enhancement wetlands, which are classified as largely degraded and should have reed vegetation conducted to improve their biodiversity values. Therefore, I would suggest to Shire officers and councillors that should this application be approved, that the following conditions need to be considered. One, that the resource enhancement wetlands, which are classified as largely degraded, are protected and that revegetation is conducted to improve their biodiversity values. Two, that the closeness of Aboriginal Site 3582 creates a need for appropriate protocol to be followed to ensure there is no disturbance caused to potential sites of significance. Three, that the Bush Forever Site in the northwest corner of Lot 400 Big Road is not only protected from clearing, but also fully assessed in regard to potential disturbances to groundwater levels that may negatively impact the health of the banks of England. And four, that a thorough consultation process and evaluation of the potential cost to the rural economic value that is currently in place and the potential negative effects on the value of rural zoned land within a five kilometre radius of the proposal is undertaken. Thank you. Thank you. Can I please ask Aaron Boots Serpentine to come forward and present your statement this evening? Thanks very much. I stand this evening to encourage the councillors, should the study proposal for 732 Punrack Road be approved by the DAP, to enforce stringent requirements strictly policed on any subsequent development. A proposal of this sort is already not in keeping with the local planning strategy and due to its size and scale is inconsistent with the objectives of the rural zone under the SJ Shire Town Planning Scheme No. 2. On top of that, the proposed facility intends to operate 339 days a year from 8am to 6pm with potential for extended hours for special events on weekends. This is a very real noise concern for the local population, both human and livestock, domestic and commercial, out to well beyond the 10 kilometre radius. The power set up for the area is not in any way equipped to handle the load a proposal of this sort requires without significant infrastructure upgrade and neither are the roads. There is also concern of increased risk of traffic incidents and hoon behaviour and problems evacuating the proposed location in the event of a fire or other emergency. 
They will also need to provide drinking water, water for cleaning in all its forms, as well as run toilets for 40,000 people, according to their projections, which are several tons of waste to be flushed and then processed in-house, as there is no government sewage program out there. There is also the question of the levels of litter produced by a crowd of that size in an area that is environmentally sensitive and upstream from internationally recognised Ramsar wetlands. My request is that the Council strictly enforce noise management procedures with stringent requirements for noise monitoring. Multiple receptors for a real-time 24-hour noise monitoring system, both within the grounds with a minimum of four of those being trackside, as well as on all willing adjacent properties within a 10-kilometre radius at least. A real-time reporting system for breaches of acceptable noise levels. A clearly defined maximum number of acceptable breaches, preferably less than 10, before the proponent is required to shut the facility down indefinitely. And a two strikes policy. After one shutdown for excessive breaches, the second shutdown would be triggered by a single breach and would sig signal the permanent closure of the facility. I would also ask that the total cost of both the installation and the maintenance of all upgrades to any existing shire or government infrastructure be clearly stated from the outset as the sole responsibility of the proponent and that the total cost of maintenance on all access roads to the facility, including but not limited to Punrak Road, Yangedi Road, River Road and Jarrow Road West, be borne by the proponent from the date of approval to accommodate the increased wear and tear which will begin right away with the surveying and building process. Thirdly, I would like to ask the councils to require the proponent to adequately manage all water within each of their proposed sites, rather than allowing water to be moved between the two sites, which increases the probability of an ecological incident that their proponent provide a clear plan for the management of all waste produced by the facility, both liquid and solid, in all forms, on site, and that the Council would commit to regular monitoring with strict penalties for any and all breaches, including a clearly defined maximum number of acceptable breaches, preferably less than three, before the proponent is required to shut the facility down. I also ask that the Council require the proponent to maintain a minimum of two firefighting tenders on site at all times, with an individual minimum water capacity of 3,000 litres per tender. Lastly, I would ask that the proponent be required to submit an independent six monthly audit to the Shire, paid for by the proponent, covering but not limited to the number of races held, the number of attendees, both participants and spectators, the number of paid employee hours worked, number of times and number of hours the track was used for non race purposes, such as practice, testing, training, etc., statistics and a full breakdown from all noise monitoring microphones and an in-depth analysis of the environmental impact of and any issues arising from the facility of over the preceding six months, including any observations or issues raised by local residents and greater area bodies, for example, the Peel Harvey Catchment Council. Thank you for your time this evening and in advance, the hard work I know you will do in dealing with these proposed requirements. Thank you. Can I please ask Roger Harrington from Oakford to please come forward and present your statement this evening? Thank you, Madam President, Councillors, and Officers. This again is regarding to the Keysbrook uh, proposal. Right business, right location. This is an example of a wrong business and wrong location. 150 hectares large enough for property size to accommodate your track as the applicant did not fully research policies, regulations, strategic plans, and other similar developments around Australia before selecting the site. EPA, DWER guidelines, industrial state policy, SPP 4.1, WA Sports, Australia, all clearly state the importance of location. Proposals tend to fit into an area which is too small. The use of private land as buffers to meet these conditions. There are at least 40 within the 2.5 kilometre buffer on which 50 100% of the property is within the buffer. Many of these properties have more than one buffer extending into the property. In my case, I've got five. EPA clearly states the cumulative impact of the proposed development and existing developments must be considered. Compared to recent approvals of motorsport complexes on private land in Western Australia and Australia, Eastbrook property is at least four to over 24 times smaller. Examples are Albany, an industrial area, it's on 200 hectares, Mulia and Bindoon, 1,200 hectares, Hayon Bend in South Australia, 650 hectares, others like Collie is in the state forest, and 
so mines near, uh, coal mines nearby. Wainaru is surrounded by quarries and large conservation areas. Kalgoorlie is surrounded by over 1,000 hectares of conservation areas. Ardinia Park, 128 hectares, surrounded by over 2,000 hectares of earmarked for industrial. This is also the only venue that is not only next to a wetland, but the property, property itself is a wetland. Link the DWE, DWER 1.5 separation from high level of watermark provides fill and drainage. At least two metres of fill will, will be a nice or proposed method of flood management. Drainage is questionable. Most sport by, by nature has a high impact on the surrounding environment. Other industries such as poultry, extractive piggeries, etc., which also by nature have a high impact on the environment. If conditions placed on them to ensure compliance, low impact on the environment, and have no cost to the community for infrastructure upgrades. Should that panel approve this development, I'd like to see the following conditions applied to this development. Proponents cover 100% of cost for upgrading and maintenance of road infrastructure and any other public infrastructure required. This will ensure minimal cost to the rate payers of the shaft. Increase the setbacks of the track and infrastructure from boundary 100 metres on lot 78 and to at least 15 metres on 400 week road. This will allow for more on site toughers and emission mitigation and screening. Federal panels should be in place of any breach of excessive noise and operating conditions or any other non compliance. Prepare an independent audit report by an accredited auditor approved by a show every six months at the cost of the applicant. On the operation, on the operation and appliance of the facility. Poultry sheds and obstructive industries have similar requirements too. More details of my objection in submission to DPLH, which I have shared with the Shire's, Shire's officers and residents. Look, there's already been set in located new most sport developments on larger tracts of land not surrounded by private property. Therefore, this motorsport is what motorsport facility must be rejected. Thank you. Thank you. Could I please ask Margaret Carla to come forward and present your statement this evening? Good evening, councillors. My statement tonight relates to agenda item 10.1.5, the amended proposed development application at Lot 7 Cargottage Road. I'm taking this opportunity to restate my concerns about this development within the context of the Water Corporation drain, which runs through Lot 7 and to the rear of my neighbouring property at Lot 282 Cargottage Road. Between the drain crossover on Cargottage Road and as far as Leapole Road, there are no levee banks on the eastern side of the drain to allow overflow areas adopted by the Water Corporation for overcapacity flooding events, permitting water to be released onto the land on the eastern side of the drain for dispersal. I was required by this shire to construct a building pad 2.5 metres high for the house on my property, which is next door to lot seven, to provide for such overflow events. The outbuildings are on lower pads. My concern is that if the shire requires similar fill on lot seven, that the magnitude of those buildings and other sealed areas will result in displacing upstream overflow flood water onto my property, thus increasing the risk to my property and buildings. It was as recently as 2021 an overflow event which caused damage to fences on my property. Older residents will remember the frequency of flooding over Cargottage Road prior to the road level being raised. This in itself has reduced the area over which flood water is dispersed. I'm aware that a stormwater management plan was submitted for Lot 7, which proposes to pump collected stormwater from roofs and car parks. A 
across the drain to the western portion of the property. My concern is not stormwater management, but as I've described, the matter of displacement caused by the actual building and car park tags. Proposed total development on Lot 7 is quite extensive and occupies a significant portion of their land between the drain and Cargottich Road. Given that my property is downstream of the proposed buildings and car parks, in the event of the drain overflowing, it is reasonable to expect that displaced water from Lot 7 will be forced to the south onto my property. In light of this possibility, I request that effective measures are taken to prevent this and that the Shire and councillors carefully consider the impact of allowing fill under the large car parking areas. I realise this is a low-lying rural area and subject already to some flooding. However, it is not reasonable to expect development of any type should place other properties at an increased risk. May I also take the opportunity to express my concerns regarding the potential for environmental damage on the site of the proposed motorsport complex in Teesbrook. I urge councillors in their consideration to heed the concerns expressed by residents and other groups regarding likely damage to local drainage patterns, groundwater and nearby bush and conservation sites. Thank you. Thank you. Could I please ask Tim Bycroft on behalf of Land Group WA to come forward and present your statement this evening? Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, Councillors, Executive, Public. I represent Land Group WA, which is a family business who own Lot 30 on Soldiers Road in Carter uh, and is identified as a development investigation area number one in the Shire's local planning strategy and detail under item 10.1.12 of the agenda. Land Group WA welcome the officer recommendation of preliminary support for the proposed MRS amendment. Subject to the WA PC initiating the amendment, we are excited to work with the Shire of Serpentine, Jarradale and broader community on the planning considerations and opportunities to progress the development vision for the site as set out in the Shire's local planning strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Could I please ask Mrs. Lee Bond to come forward and present your statement this evening? It is acceptable for the residents of this shire to use the mulch from Watkin Road transfer station, but the council won't touch it. Good news is the mulch has been it appropriately and I have excellent proof of its usefulness on gardens. Having used mulch from elsewhere a number of years ago, I had the misfortune to grow an abundance of weeds that proliferated for a very long time. How about support, supporting your local ratepayer? Our wasteful spending, cut wasteful spending and use the free mulch. It does work. What is the splash park going to cost after all this time on the back burner? And where is the 300,000 already allocated for this? It looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's a duck. Support by a mate on this council to run at the last minute for the North Ward elections. Oh, hang on, sorry. It's no secret two particular candidates have been supported by a mate on this council to run at the last minute for the North Ward elections. Another total waste of ratepayer money for two people just so one person can keep pushing her agenda. One not known to the Shire, nor does she live in the Shire. Council rate height for some residents has shown how non-transparent this council has been with rate assessments. And you know this because this Shire failed the transparency test. How shameful. 
Thank you, Mrs. Bond. Could I please ask Beverly Brickwood to come forward and present your statement this evening? Our president and councillors, I implore that we reject the proposed notice board procedure. There no compromise people living very close to the proposed motorsport facility with noise production as being the main reason for local residents' objections. The World Health Organization has listed noise pollution as one of the worst environmental stresses for humans, second only to air pollution. It has been linked to increases in stress and cortisol levels with endocrinological disruptions compromised immune system, hearing impairment, poor cognition, poor sleep patterns and insomnia, increased anxiety and depression, a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness, both linked to suicide. Cardiovascular disease incidents of stroke, digestive disturbances and chronic diseases such as cancer. These are very real concerns for the population in this area. There's also a big risk of foot and mouth disease being transmitted with patrons arriving from everywhere, directing to a rural area with hooved animals in close proximity. May I draw your attention to local planning strategy pages 22 to 24 and the map on page 25. The map does not show any equine industry around River Road, Yangon North or Elliott Road or anywhere in this area. There are many equine businesses in the area. They would all be adversely affected by the noise and traffic generated by a motorsport facility. The same document on page 44 lists the motorsport facility, quote, attract and encourage the diversification and development of businesses which are likely to contribute to local tourism and employment, such as a motorsport and tourism facility in Keysbrook, subject to necessary approvals through appropriate land use planning. Is this a foregone conclusion? Why is the motorsport facility listed on, a, in, on the local planning strategy? Still only a proposal, and yet here it is an unofficial document. Again, I ask the council to reject the motorsport proposal as inappropriate for this area. Thank you. Thank you. Please ask Trevor and Sue, Susan Simmons to come forward and present your statement this evening. The five has been reduced in size by a third since the actual amended submission we have seen by erecting a fence across it. Step five has no grass in it except for the weed that has come up from the building to the overall team. Grass can be established and takes at least six months with no more supply, so again, that only leaves paddock six and the day paddock there. Local manure was said that they will harrow into paddocks. This will only pull up new grass in paddock five, and most of the paddock six will generally not eat grass for the year on, so that leaves no day paddocks. And with no licence for, as it was not transferred or purchased, a new board licence will be needed and may not get onto the previous licence tag. They may not be able to irrigate the set to the extent they say that they will irrigate. For the dust management, they state the arena gets water when making a riding, but this is incorrect. Not all the time. They stated they erected sprinklers around the arena, but that is also incorrect. Previous owners did that when they built the arena for a year, possibly four years ago. As sprinklers are not allowed to be used between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m., this could create a problem, and until new ball licenses to obtain, balls would actually not be used at all for anything. Question three. Storm water. How will they keep the stormwater runoff from their property contained on their property after putting a lot, a lot of fill in paddock five, which is next to our property? Never had a problem before in the past. Before the fill went in. They state that Arena has underground drain pipes that go to the northwest corner with grapes, filter out sand. 
But this is not true. As previous owner has told us, that there is nothing in that area except an hundred level blue metal and fifty level sand on top. Have photos and videos of recent flooding of the northwest corner of Ravina flowing off and over into our cattle. Thank you. Thank you. Can I please ask Michael Van Dendel from Monday Jong to come forward and present your statement this evening? Good evening, Madam President, Cheryl Rich and Council. I diverted today, but I'll recently inform me that the petition to construct a footpath along Adonis and Richardson Street will back up on the agenda with an attached proposal to move forward. I note a proposal in three stages to build the footpath. I wish to express thanks and appreciation on behalf of the petitioners and my family for the work done so far. An engineer also contacted me myself some weeks back and I appreciated his openness to discuss the petition and a chance to explain to him some of the reasons for the petition. We sincerely hope that it gets approved this evening. Thank you. Item four is petitions and deputations of which there is nil. Item five is the president's report. Good evening and welcome to the ordinary council meeting for September 2022. I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Since news of the Queen's passing, flags out the front of our Civic Centre have been flying at half-mast as a mark of respect. Moving on to local matters, it was great to see the completion of several local projects which were funded by state government election commitments. These projects included the new fencing installed at the Serpentine Sports Reserve, the new basketball hoops and fresh LED lighting installed at the SJ Community Recreation Centre and the completion of upgrades and refurbishment works at the Old Hopeland School Hall. It was great to catch up with the member for Darling Range, Hugh Jones, and see firsthand how these works are greatly benefiting, benefiting many SJ community groups. On Friday the 26th of August, I was pleased to officially open the SJ Library Services building in Byford with Senator Louise Pratt. It was a lovely morning celebrating the new community facility along with a welcome to country from senior Wadjuk traditional owner Mr Nigel Wilkes and a dance performed by students from the Byford Secondary College. Over the past month, I met with the following state government MPs with the CEO, Mr Paul Martin. The East Metropolitan Region MLC, Matthew Swinbourne, to discuss local matters and priorities. Racing and Gaming Minister, Tony Booty, to discuss Byford Trotting Complex. Member for Darling Range, Hugh Jones, to discuss local matters and priorities. I was pleased to attend the Mundijong SES Recognition Night on the 31st of September. 31st of August. Our local state emergency services crews have worked tirelessly throughout what has been a wet and wild winter, and I thank them for ensuring the safety of many of our residents, homes and businesses when called upon during emergencies. Earlier this month, the Shire hosted the Western Australian Local Government Association's Peel Zone members and state councillors. These meetings are a fantastic opportunity to meet with our neighbouring local governments and to share the exciting progress happening across our region with Walga State Councillors and Executives. On Saturday, the Shire celebrated Citizen, Citizenship Day with Citizenship Ceremony at the SJ Community Recreation Centre. I was pleased to confirm 11 conferees as Australian citizens and celebrate with their friends and family over morning tea. Finally, I would like to close by acknowledging the passing of long-term SJ resident and former Shire councillor, Mervyn Gossage. 
Mervyn was an active contributor to our community over a long period of time. And on behalf of the council, I pass on my condolences to the Gossage family at this sad time. As always, my full calendar can be viewed on the following pages. Item six is declaration of councillors and officers' interests. Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Paul Martin, declared a financial interest in item 8.1 CEO Employment Committee meeting, 8th of August, 2022. As the CEO Employment Committee at this meeting deals with his annual performance review, the extent of the interest is that Mr. Martin is the CEO and the outcomes directly impact him financially. Mr. Martin will leave the chambers while this item is discussed. Manager of Community Activation, Ms. Rebecca Steinke, declared an impartiality interest in item 10.4.1, RFT 11 2021, contract for the Serpentine Jaredale Community Recreation Centre Management Services. As Ms. Steinke is a member of the SJ Community Recreation Centre as part of the Shire's Employee Wellness Program and other recreational pursuits. Councillor Tricia Duggan declared an impartiality interest in item 10.4.1 RFT 11 2021, contract for the Serpentine Jaredale Community Recreation Centre Management Services, as Councillor Duggan is a member of the SJ. CR Rec Centre under current management of the YMCA. Councillor Lauren Strange declared an impartiality interest in item 10.4.2, 2021-2022 Byford Town Team Outcomes, as Councillor Strange is a member of the Activate Byford Group. Item 7 is confirmation of minutes of previous council meetings. Item 7.1 is the ordinary council meeting held on the 15th of August 2022. Can I please have a mover for these minutes? Thank you, Councillor Strange. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Bias. Is there anybody opposed to these minutes? Motion is carried unanimously. Item eight is receipt of minutes or reports and consideration of adoption of recommendations from committee meetings held since the previous council meeting. Madam, eight. I'm sorry. Madam President, I've declared an interest, financial interest in this item, so I'll leave the room for this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Item 8.1 is a CEO Employment Committee meeting held on the 8th of August 2022. Can I please have a move up for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Bias. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Can we please ask the CEO to return? Mr. Martin, the council resolution was carried unanimously. Item 8.2 is the Audit Risk and Governance Committee meeting held on the 22nd of August 2022. Can I please have a mover for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Bias. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Item nine is motions 
of which notice has been given. 9.1 is notice of motion, Keenan Park Stakeholder Reference Group. Can I please have a mover for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Atwell. Can I please have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Strawtons. Madam President, I just had a quick question. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I understand the intention of what's um, being proposed here, but I, I just am finding the wording in 2A and 2B um, somewhat confusing. Just so I'm clear, is in the process is that um, any expressions of interest will go to the stakeholder group first, and then that group will make a recommendation to council. Uh, Madam President, that's my understanding of Councillor Atwell's motion. Yes. Thank you. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Not opposed, Madam President, but I do have a question, if I may. Yes. I'm not quite sure who it would be too, so I'll just direct to the CEO. I understand that the Serpentine Serpents, the rugby team, are keen in participating in this group. Is there a mechanism for us to, and I appreciate the, the uh, amount of work that would go into expressions of interest going to the group, the group providing a recommendation to us back to council and so on and so forth. Is there any way we can perhaps expedite that in a similar way that we did when we set up the group in, let me get my facts correct, at the special council meeting of the 6th of December, in which it's noted, as this is a short time frame, it will not be possible to return a report to council to formally appoint individuals to the stakeholder reference group. So what we did was we nominated the groups to then provide their representatives. Would it be possible for us to provide an amendment to this, which gives the group the opportunity to accept a representative from the SJ Serpents? Uh, Madam President, if the if the council was of a mind to do that of a particular group, it could actually amend the terms of reference uh, in point three and add now a representative of the SJ Serpents or any other group it wanted to do. Um, I understand there's some interest from that group to be involved. Um, that's the option that the council would have. Alternatively, go through that process. I think that the terms of reference also include the opportunity for the chairperson to invite other members to particular meetings. I'm just referring to the terms of reference now as as required. So, in the if that group was interested in the interim, that might be a mechanism to have them involved in the short term as well. And I guess that would be my follow up question. Is I I appreciate that the chair can invite members, but that's, I guess, you know, inviting them to participate is quite different from inviting them to be a part of of the group. So I'd, I'd perhaps seek some guidance on on that point. Um, so I appreciate that the chair can invite others, but that's as a non-voting participant, effectively. Councillor Bias, would you like to move an amendment to the motion? Yes, I would, Madam President. Uh, along those lines, I'd be happy to take advice on the best uh, best wording for that. Uh, Madam President, if I could suggest that the amendment might be something to the effect of that um, uh, amends point three to say amends the terms of reference, take this into this account into approach, and also appoints a member of the SJ Serpents to the Keenan Park Stakeholder Reference Group. Uh, also appoints um, a representative from the SJ Serpents. I'm not sure of the exact name of the group. I'm looking for someone on the side over there to. Serpents Rugby League. I guess this was the. Yeah. Uh, Rugby League Club to the group.
The uh, name of the group is the Serpentine Jaredale Rugby League and Sporting Club. I, I have a question on my own amendment, if I may, Mr. CEO. Um, practically, how would would officers deliver deliver that? So I'm conscious that there will be a meeting, and that terms of references will change. Um, so how how would we go about receiving a a representative? Would we need to stipulate that that the the, the working group would need to vote to receive the representative, or is it just by default because we've changed the terms of references? They the, any, the representative that the club then sends along will then be part of the group by default. That's correct. I think the latter's the correct uh, uh, through you, Madam President, that we would write to the club or invite the club to nominate a representative and whoever they choose to send along would be the representative of that club. It wouldn't be for the for the stakeholder reference group to say, no, you're not the right person. Excellent. It's up to the individual club to nominate who their representative is. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Madam President, I'm happy to move that amendment. Bias. Can I please have a seconder for the amendment? Thank you, Councillor Strange. Is Madam President, uh, sorry to interrupt, but just as uh, SJ Serpents has been named explicitly, I need to declare an impartiality interest um, because one of my sons plays for the team. So the extent of my interest is, is just happy to see them included in the advocacy um, of all the other sporting clubs. Impartiality. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Is there anybody opposed to this amendment? The amendment is carried unanimously. So we'll move back to the substantive motion, which has been moved and seconded, which now includes the amendment. Is there anybody opposed to the substantive motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Madam President, I, I'm not sure whether we need to get a, a reason for the difference from the Office of Recommendation as it's a council on nurse motion. I'll much ask the Manager of Governance. No, thank you. Item 10 is Chief Executive Officer Reports. 10.1 is Development Services Reports. 10.1.1 is Retrospective Development, Keeping of Five Horses, Stable Construction of Horse Arena, Removal of Trees and Proposed Development, Removal of an Additional, Removal of 26 Additional Trees, Lot 8726 Carbro Drive, Carter. I have a alternate motion which I wish to put forward. The changes from the officer's recommendation are all contained within condition B. Condition B would now read, within 60 days of this approval, a revegetation plan shall be submitted to and approved by the Shire of Serpentine Jaredale. The plan shall demonstrate suitable replacement of native vegetation within the existing eastern vegetation zone on the subject land to offset the 2,400 square metre of tree canopy removed from the southwest corner of the subject land. The revegetation plan shall include. One, the number of trees, saplings to be planted, including the use of advanced plantings of minimum height of one metre at establishment. Two, the species of the tree saplings with selection of species local and native to the area. Item number three, four, five and six remain as per the officer's recommendation. And then once approved, the revegetation re plan shall be implemented by the winter of 2023 and maintained by the, maintained to the satisfaction of the Shire of Serpentine, Jaredale. Can I please have a mover for this motion, uh, a seconder for this motion, please? 
Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Not opposed, Madam President, but a question, if I may. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned by winter of 2023. Do you, do you feel the need for a hard date? Uh, that, that's a three-month window, effectively. Are you comfortable with that, that wording? Uh, yes, I am. It, it gives time for the planning to take place and then for the, the planting to occur within that window. And my question to the CEO and the director, by extension, being um, that that's significant, that's um, sufficient guidance for officers. You know, the, the term winter being understood as the, you know, June, July, August. You don't need hard hard dates. I'll ask the director of development services to respond. Uh, thank you for the question. I guess with some of the climatic variability, sometimes we have a, a late autumn, sometimes an, uh, a, a winter that does persist. So I guess it does give a degree of um, flexibility, but certainly it's very clear that the season of winter 2023 is when the revegetation has to be established by in accordance with the approved plan. Thank you, Director, CEO. Thank you, Madam President. I have no objection to the motion. To this alternate motion. Motion is carried unanimously. Madam President, we'll need a reason for the difference of the officer recommendations for the minutes, please. To reinstate canopy cover that has been lost with the removal of trees without any approval. Can, canopy tree cover, which has been removed without any approval. Item 10.1.2, proposed road naming, lot 128 South Western Highway, Byford. Can I please have a mover for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Strange. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Bias. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Item 10.1.3. Proposed adoption of local planning policy, tree retention and planting. Can I please have a mover for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Bias. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Item 10.1.4. Proposed adoption of local planning policy 4.24, child minding centres. Can I please have a mover for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Stratons. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Strange. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Motion is carried unanimously. Item 10.1.5, proposed... Madam President, can I propose an alternate motion on this one, please? Councillor D'Agostino. Uh, I would propose a deferral of the matter. You're proposing a procedural deferral? No, just a normal... I'll just check... Madam President, I advised Councillor D'Agostino earlier he could either do a procedural motion or deferral, or we could have a motion to defer it with some reasons and so that it can be looked into. Can I suggest then, Councillor, you, you include the reasons for your deferral in the motion? So, Council defers the matter for whatever reason. Thank you. Uh, they are in relation to a variety of stormwater issues. Um, I can sort of outline some of those um, in relation to the tank runoff. The tank runoff the inconsistency with normal provisions on developments in relation to stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. 
the uh, sorry the tarmac runoff. Oh no, yeah. So it's generally stormwater runoff, and I do have some concerns in relation to the advertisement that was undertaken under our policy LPP one point four. It expressly states, let me just get my wording correct, that the policy says outside town, town, town site boundaries, an advertisement of, uh, must be advertised at least 500 metres. Yet in this um, document on page 57, it, the report says the application was advertised to landowners within a 500 metres radius of the subject site. And I think that is in. Uh, Contrary to LPP 1.4, which says at least 500 metres. Are you asking the officers to do further investigation or bring the report back, or, or how would you like the matter to be dealt? I, I would like I would like there to be further advertisement to landowners within a 1,200 metre radius. Noting that in this is a, a rural area and there are some very large rural properties, and 500 metres is not very far. Within a 1200 no. metre radius. Would you like me to help you with the wording of that? Yeah, so, could you. I suggest that the wording might be that one council defers, that one uh, council one defers the matter, and you, as you've sort of got there. Oh, thank you. Yes. And, and then, then secondly. And then second might be there. That's right, Mandy. Yes, thank you. To request the CEO further advertise the yes, to take, development to application. Up, yeah. Perfect. Um, Mr. Martin, could I please make the suggestion that it is deferred to come to a policy concept forum before further advertisement takes place so that council has a full understanding of what we're actually dealing with this evening? Uh, Madam President, I'm not sure whether a policy concept forum is the best, best venue to be discussing a development application, to be entirely honest. Um, it's not so much the development application in its uh, entirety, but the advertisement uh, oh, the portion yes. of it and yes. the uh, policy as as stated by Councillor D'Agostino. Happy for that to happen. Yeah. So uh, further advertisement to landowners within a 1200 metre radius following discussion at a policy concept forum. I don't like Kelby in this. Increasing it to 1200 metres actually include anybody against it? Um, Councillor, well, I did clarify that with. Um, the director, and it does, sorry, it does. It goes out, goes north of Gossage Road, which currently doesn't. If that makes sense. So currently, uh, um, the advertisement didn't go to properties north of Gossage Road. Does that make sense? Am I going? Yeah, north. Of, I just did. Back I know, you check the yeah, I have with Andrew. But, um, often, often that it's more it has made. It does make a difference. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. Councillor D'Agostino, can I suggest that we just do a bit of wordsmithing to point number one? Um, so the council defers the matter in relation, defers the matter for a variety of stormwater issues. Are you happy with that yes. being the, the overall thing, or do you want to add the other bits as well? No, 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 delete the other bits is fine. So maybe just say deletes the matter uh, for uh, or in relation, yeah, or however you want to say it, and then delete the tank runoff and all those other things. The rest of that sentence, thank you. Yep. And requests following. Yes, that's fine. Stormwater issues. Defers the matter due to a variety of stormwater yep, issues. That's fine. Yep. Thank you. I'm okay with that. A question, if I may, Madam President. Councillor Bias. Um, to the CEO, most likely through to to the director. I'm always. I'm always conscious with planning decisions that there always seems to be some foreboding ticking clock above us um, with deadlines we have to meet. I trust that this would likewise have some time frame that we legislatively need to hit. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, that is correct. This this was advertised, so subject to a 90-day um, determination period. So the application was received on the 27th of May. So June, July, August, it's just uh, over its 90-day period currently. So at that point, an applicant can accept the deemed refusal um, and then they can seek a review of the decision via the State Administrative Tribunal if they wish. So am I understanding that correctly in that if this is deferred, the applicant will have the default position of going directly to the SAT? That's correct. While I'm asking questions, Madam President, I'll ask, uh, ask one more. Um, can the director confirm that we did comply with the policy in terms of advertising within the 500 metres? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, we did comply with the local planning policy, in my professional opinion. Thank you, Director. See you, Madam President. We have an alternate motion before us and has been moved by Councillor D'Agostino. Can I please have a seconder for this motion? Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Councillor Bias, Councillor D'Agostino, would you like to open debate, please? Thanks, Madam President. I think, um, as the, uh, the the rate payer outlined, there are a number of concerns in relation to stormwater disposal on this property, and the and as Water Corp have said, the runoff from the development needs to be restricted to pre-development levels, and I think that's also captured in our development approvals normally, and we have a similar condition which I'll talk about, and the applicant's own export report says. The roof is 2,900 square metres. The roof will have runoff of seven times the capacity of the, the proposed rainwater tanks, and then the excess water will flow into the drains based on an average rainfall. So, we, and part of the, the real concern I have here is we have no idea how much water will flow into the drain from the roof. It simply isn't clear, and it's not part of the expert's report. Then there's also the tarmac. It's 5,200 square metres. They have a swale, or call it a drain, which stores 80 cubic metres, which is 15 mils of rain. And for those of us that live in the area, we know how often we get more than 15 mils of rain. And once that happens, it flows into the drain. And that's in an average year. So again, we don't know how much rain is going to go off the tarmac and into the drain. And then, as I've, I've outlined, and I, I appreciate what the director has said, but I think the level of consultation is unclear. As I say, LPP 1.4, this is the wording, said, says it must be advertised outside the town site boundaries of at least 500 metres. Yet the report on page 57 says the application was advertised to landowners within 500 metres radius of the subject site. Clearly, it's contrary to, to 1.4, and at best, if it, it's got to be resolved and taken away and looked at properly, because I have significant concerns in that respect. And as I've said, I'd, I'd ask for it to be advertised, re-advertised within a distance of 1,200. We're in rural properties there. That's a rural area, and 500 metres is, is not far, which is why it hasn't captured many properties. Um, and I think if you look at, it's also unclear what's the square meterage of the amended roof and how does that differ? Um, and I think this is important and I, I really struggle with this one. For other applications, all applicants have to keep their stormwater on the property. The standard wording, and we see it week after, or meeting after meeting, all stormwater shall be disposed of within the property. Direct disposal of stormwater onto water courses and drainage lines is not permitted. So I'm unclear why this is dealt with differently. And I think where will the Water Corp requirement be incorporated? And going back to really what Water Corp is saying is it's got to be status quo. There can't be more water. Yet there's nowhere in the experts report or what we've been told to show how the roof with its seven times the capacity of the rainwater tanks, how the, how the tarmac with only the ability to store 15 cubic metres of water. We've got no idea what that total of water volume is and how that will be managed into the drain, and then importantly, how that will affect other landowners. And I think, you know, we 
when we don't know what the estimated total volume of water is to go into the drain from this amended development, I have real concerns. For those of us that live in the area, we know how full that drain gets in a normal year, let alone in a heavy rainfall year like we've had the last two years. And I believe there needs to be more work done on the forecast volume that will flow into the drain, why it's allowed to flow into the drain, different to other development approvals, and also to work out this issue of where it should have been advertised. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor D'Agostino. I have a question for the director uh, before we hear from Councillor Duggan. This report we have before us is an amendment to a development application that has already been approved by Council. And this amendment is purely for the roof structure of the building. Does that then allow us to go back and look at the full development application with all of the uh, conditions that have already been approved by Council? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, my professional opinion, the answer to that question is no. Um, the stormwater management plan has actually been approved uh, previously already by officers within our infrastructure directorate. So they have a, an approved stormwater management plan for the development. Um, my professional opinion is that um, the we we live by the rules, we die by the rules. They've got a valid planning approval. They are seeking alterations to the physical building to change its physical appearance. Um, so my professional opinion is that it would not give us the ability to revisit the original decision, which was a approval subject to conditions. Thank you. And a second question, if I may, Director. With the proposed changes to the roof structure, would that alter the footings and the wall structure of the, the already approved building to facilitate the change in the roof design? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of the um, stormwater management plan, um, as part of flood management, it actually sets a minimum level which this building has to be built at. In terms of changing the actual details of its construction, um, I guess its construction robustness and its construction appropriateness, that's something we defer to the building permit stage. So in the planning permit stage, we're looking at land use and development. The building permit stage will look at whether the building is compliant with the National Construction Code, which all buildings in the in the nation need to, to be compliant with. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Duggan, would you like to speak or reserve? I'll speak. Thanks, Madam President. Um, only briefly, though, I think Councillor D'Agostino has done a very good job with um, summing up the, his position. Um, I, I guess my uh, additional point is that when we're changing the roof line so significantly, I don't feel we've been given suitable uh, information on how that could actually affect a runoff from the building. Um, will it increase it, make it faster? Will it actually hold some roof, uh, some of the water in the roof because of its um, different different structure? And so therefore, for me, it questions the reliability and the validity of the previous stormwater management plan. So that's where I can see where there is a tie between the stormwater management and the significant change in the building. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Duggan. Councillor Bias? A question first before I debate, if I may, Madam President. Yes. Um, through the CEO through to, to the director, um, there have been concerns raised about runoff volumes, et cetera. This is an already approved application. Um, given that the amendment does propose changes are any of the conditions allowed to be changed to accommodate these amendments thank you um, for the question um, through the chair um, the deemed provisions of our local planning scheme um, do actually allow um, a an amendment to a planning approval to be, and it's specifically on page 60 of the agenda, um, 
it allows an amendment or an application to amend a planning approval to be approved with conditions, without conditions, or actually refused. So the amendment can certainly be subject to conditions, and indeed the, the officer recommendation does propose um, that this amendment be subject to a condition. Thank you, Director, CEO, Madam President. Um, Madam President, I'll keep my remarks very brief because I'm not an engineer. I'm not an expert in all of these things. Uh, the director and his teams, they are. I put a great deal of trust in the reports that were provided and the advice we receive. The last thing I want to see is a situation where we don't achieve our legislated timeframes as required of us uh, with the planning uh, planning regulations and that this goes to SAT and goes beyond our, our control. So, Madam President, I'm quite comfortable with what the officers have provided. I'm very comfortable with their recommendations. And should this motion be defeated, I'm more than happy to move, um, foreshadow the movement of the original officer's recommendation. Thank you. Bias. Is there anybody else that would like to speak for the motion? Councillor D'Agostino, would you like to close, please? Thanks, Madam President, and uh, thank you to Councillor Duggan. I thought um, you know the points she made were, were very pertinent and relevant. And I think there's some really key issues here, and, uh, and I do believe that we are within our rights, and I don't think we should be dictated to or concerned about the legislative framework in the sense that we need to get this right. And here I think there's some serious questions and issues and concerns that have been raised by the ratepayer. And, and there's some real challenges. And I do believe that we could, um, if we take this away, we could resolve this and get it sorted in the interest of the applicant. And, and, and I think we could work with the applicant, with the ratepayers and everyone to make sure that we've got the stormwater issues and the like managed. Thank you. So that's hence why I'd like to see it taken away and dealt with to resolve the, the uncertainty. Thank you, Councillor D'Agostino. All those in favour of this alternate motion? All those against? Motion is lost to five. Councillor Bias, you have foreshadowed the officer's recommendation. Yes, Madam President, I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Bias. Can I please have a seconder for the officer's recommendation? Thank you, Councillor Atwell. Is there anybody opposed? Madam President, could I ask a question of Councillor Bias whether he would consider some conditions in relation to stormwater disposal? More than happy to hear any uh, any amendments, Madam President. Um, and and I'll, I'll need some assistance from the director, but... Thanks, Dean, are you putting these forward as an amendment to the motion? Yes, please. At the uh, director, what I'm trying to capture is the Water Corporation's wording in the report um, that the runoff from the development, that there must be an engineering report. Um, now, is that already captured in there that there will be an engineering report to make sure the runoff from the development is restricted to pre development levels? Thank you for the question. Um, if there's a concern about that, um, I'm sure that a condition could be crafted to make that very explicit. Um, certainly happy to assist um, in that process. Madam President, in the interests of ensuring this is done right, I'd propose that we, um, and I'm struggling for the correct wording, but uh, adjourn for a period of 10 minutes to allow Councillor D'Agostino to confer with the Director.